It's your boy, Flavor Flav, and this is Chris Angel's Talking Junkies. This is incredible. You know, I am so blessed to be able to do this show, Mind Freak, at Planet Hollywood in Vegas, because you never know who's going to come and see the show, and then I can basically make them feel obligated to do Talking Junkies. We are with the legend. I'm talking about the longest member of SNL, actor, many movies, comedian, the hilarious Kenan Thompson. Well, thank you very much. Man. Thank you so much for ha being here. That show was incredible. Thanks for having me. This <laughs> night was amazing. Like, I'm sitting behind my side so nice. he raised his hand. Just I'm telling you, Completely, it's real. like, just blown away. It actually made it more fun for me. Because I, I like, told you I was going to get into it. I get really into amazing. magic, and, like, I love... Whatever, anybody trying to entertain anybody, you know what I mean? Have you ever done magic? Do that. No, but like I'm a big fan of, yeah, you, like you, any other magician that I've seen, like do it very well. And you just did it, but you just did like 10 iconic fucking tricks in front of people that are like historic. And you, you. like you're doing it every day. Yes. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're out of your mind. That's amazing. Thank you. And, and no, and, and you know, um, I don't know if you were a fan of Steve Martin or still are. Absolutely. But Steve Martin started off as a magician. Yes, he did. Right? Um, which is fascinating. He used to do Carson and, and, and he would do um, a Fly Dini, which was based off of Sly Dini, who was like one of the pioneer close-up artists. And he would do this kind of spoof called the Great Fly Dini, I believe it was. And he would do a thing from his fly, his zipper. And he would have all these crazy things happening from his zipper, but... Well, we you all know, know that, right? Yeah. Co comedy is such a huge, as you can see in the show, but I'm not a funny guy. In real life, I'm very serious, but on stage, like, it's all about timing. And I have so much respect for comedians. And like what blows my mind and really what I want to drill down on is the fact that you do SNL live. Yeah. You know, like if we screw up right now, we can, we can do it again. But I would love to hear some of the craziest experience because you've been there for over 20 years. Yeah. The craziest experiences that you've had happen live. Well, I mean, the whole thing is is crazy each time that's why like 20 years goes by you know you know you look up and you know 20 years is like in the past or on tape or whatever you know what i'm saying and like it's hard for me to gauge like what i was doing each and every day all those days but like i mean i kind of know like i'm a parent now <laughs> you know i had a marriage and <laughs> like that kind of stuff and i gauge it that way or whatever but it was a lot of fucking crazy ass moments man that ashley simpson shit was crazy like give, give us give what's, us like one what's the ashley simpson is that Ashley the, is Simpson that, was the craziest one that I ever saw because is that the yeah, thing? it was just, you know, most, you know, as comedians, you know, we learn to kind of roll with it. You know what I mean? Like whatever happens, like it's funnier if you embrace the moment kind of thing. That's what everybody loves about live television. But she kind of just, you know, shut down and checked out of it. And like, I never seen anybody do that before. You know what I mean? Like this is Saturday Night Live. You're supposed to like go up there and like sing live and like be you know full of enough talent to like be there you know of caliber or whatever but it, it was a mistake like they started playing the first song again and you know her computer just shut down and she gave up you know what i mean and like what was that like for you i was backstage because i was in the very next sketch or whatever so this was like in my first couple few years or whatever so i was very present in the studio always i didn't want to miss anything you know i was always around even if I, my sketch was like you know 20 minutes later, I would just be around just to make sure like I didn't miss it or whatever. So I was just backstage ready, you know, like, and I had her song and commercial time to like get my shit together and get, you know, to the stage, but I was just back there ready, you know what I mean? And I was watching on like this tiny little monitor or whatever, <laughs> and I saw her do that, you know, dumbass dance, and she just, you know, trotted off stage <laughs> and, you know, like they went to commercial, and I didn't know what they were gonna do, they went to commercial, and then lights came up on my set, you know what I mean? Because it was dark where I was at first. And then the lights came up. I was like, oh, shit, I guess they're just going to move on. Yeah, and they just moved on. That's funny. I, I never thought about that. As far as entertainers go, a comedian naturally has to be able to improvise, adapt, and overcome. Because between hecklers, between reading a room, oh, yeah. you guys are constantly making adjustments on the fly. Yeah. Whereas a say, singer, you're natural up there, it's a man. Set, so she wouldn't know how to 
things fall apart, their mind isn't as adapted as you guys as far as like, oh, I gotta, I gotta fucking make some adjustments real quick and float with this. Yeah, yeah it's a little I, more rehearsed. Yeah. Right, yeah, there's a pattern she has to follow. Yeah. She's reading words with you guys, like I said, you she made adjustments on the fly. She shut down and was like, this is not my fault and I'm not she dealing with this. So as opposed worse. to just being like, uh, mistake, you know, started over or whatever and embrace the moment and and then like sing it. This is your moment. You know, yeah. this is Saturday Night Live. Down, it look even worse. You know, but I, I think she was just young for, for you know, a, a situation like that to just derail like that. She didn't have the chops to like know how to handle. I have, I, I've had a lot of crazy experiences. I've had a woman on stage with her top that fell down and she's yeah. Bare naked, no bra, nothing, you know, which was hysterical. It's pretty awesome. I've had I've had the fire alarm go off and the entire audience had to go to the parking lot, including myself. And then what did you do? I, I 30 minutes out in the parking lot, and then I had to come back and win them over. You know, that tests your ability. And I think, you know, those moments, you know, even when I did kids parties, clubs, you know, it really builds like a comedian that goes and plays in the small clubs. That's where you build the chops. It's not like I'm doing a show tonight. Tonight I did a show with my experience since I was, you know, 11 years old when I first started performing. And it's all those years that make you a seasoned performer like you. Like, how do you deal with the nerves? Like the first time that you're doing SNL and you know it's live, you know there's no fuck up opportunity for you. You gotta be on, you have Lauren watching, you have you know millions of people. How do you, how do you manage um, the nerves? It's my least favorite part of it. You know, it's like a, a big reason why I don't really do stand up. you know? Um, like I just hate living with something that I fear so much all day long and then you go up and perform and it's fine. You know what I mean? Like, because you do have the ability to do it, but you care. It was what I've been told. Like you get nervous because you care yeah. and you want to do a good show. So it's on your mind. But, you know, acting for me is, you know, much more smoother. You know what I mean? Cause I've been trained to be an actor. I wasn't trained to be like an observer so I can make any audience laugh at anything necessarily. Like I'm a performer, you know what I'm yeah. saying? But nerves. Nerves, when it's time for the live show, it yeah. always, it's always there. Can work for you or against you. Depends how you redirect it. I try to turn it into adrenaline. Yeah. I charge myself up and mm -hmm. I just get excited about everything. I get excited about the band playing the warm up music. I sing a fucking warm up song before both shows. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, with some of my castmates, you know, that are singing like backup and shit like that with the band, blah, blah, blah. Just warming up the audience before the show. You know, been doing that for several years, you know what I mean? And I just try to like get excited about everything. That way my performance will be high energy. And if it's, you know, a fuck up, then it'll be a high energy fuck up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and like, we'll just embrace that. And that'll be the party, you know? But I've had my days where I let my nerves get the better of me. And it's so much more fun to just be like, no, nah, like, just let it go. Treat it like it's not live television. Yeah. Just have fun like with it's it. It's like, yeah, you're here with your friends. The audience is friendly, like it's a comedy show, you know what yeah. I mean? They're not coming to see a Western. So like everybody's <laughs> in a good mood, you know what I mean? They wanna like celebrate life and like, they're giving us an hour and a half of their attention. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, I just wanna like service that basically. I'm still bugging out that everybody here is very calm after we just watched you flying around us to hey, what, <laughs> Like what is happening? I don't understand that. We should do a spoof. Like you're levitating. Yes. Like that would be hysterical. Yeah, I've and then we have like these big lines on you and it's supposed to be painted out. We <laughs> could create not a working. whole yeah. skit about you're but the great, you know, there whatever. There was no lines. There was no lines. You were flying. No, I'm, I'm just saying. That's we just crazy. put like some thick, make it really oh, for the funny joke. Absolutely. for your show. Like, But you're the one who's the magician and we have a competition and it's not even me. Maybe I'm David Blaine. Yeah, sure. Because I can do his total shit. That kind of shit works on the show. Uh, it'd be hysterical. You who jumping in the characters is great. Favorite, like a guest, because you've had so many incredible guests on there, yeah. but a guest that you're just like, Frank, like you're a comedian, you love doing comedy too on stage, but like a guest that you would just die to like meet and now you're like doing a scene, a skit with them. Like, yeah, Eddie was, Eddie was definitely one of those, you know, Sandler too. I mean, I have a list of them because like that place is so special, but Eddie Murphy for sure was like, we never thought it would happen. You know, he was the one that like semi kind of got away and never came back, you right. know what I mean? And like, 
we just never thought that he would ever come back and do the show ever because I'm I'm sure the door has been open since 88, you know what I'm saying? And then like come back and host, he just never did it. And he ended up doing it. And that was a Christmas show and it was a fucking magical time. You know what I mean? Refresh everybody's thing. memories who are watching or listening. Who Eddie Murphy what, is. No, <laughs> what, <laughs> what the skit was, you did it with him? I mean, we, I was in the monologue with him, which okay. was crazy. So it so was- tell me about that. Eddie Murphy comes out after a 30 year, maybe 35 year departure from the show. like probably one of the biggest stars to come out of the show, if not the biggest, you know, like movie stars or whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden he's just there. He's there. And, you know, we have our host for six days. You know what I'm saying? It's not like he's you there like for a couple of hours. Yeah. Spending time and like, you know, in a black household, Eddie Murphy was, you know, definitely the like king. the king in my generation for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like by far, like he gave it up to Richard, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and Cosby did his thing or whatever, but like Eddie was the movie star. You know what I'm saying? He was like, the golden child. He, he did a movie, you know, the golden child. So all of a sudden he's just in the same hallways that I've been like running around in, like, you know, playing with my castmates, you know, smoking in, you know, blah, 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 like <laughs> hanging out. And like they, the one of your like iconic, like legendary, you know, icon mentor kind of people is just around you all of a sudden, you know, and in your stomping grounds and asking you your opinions about things. You know what I mean? It was wild. So the monologue was him, and then four other legends come out, Dave Chappelle, Tracy Morgan, and wow. Chris Rock. And then, you know, Michael Che wrote me into it, you know what I mean? So it was just like a picture of all five of us, which like I have to this day, it's like my most cherished moment probably on the show. That had to be probably one of the most nerve wracking moments. You're sitting there with Crazy. people you've admired before you were famous and you're like watching them on, you know, on television and movies. And now you're on scene. It must be like almost surreal. It was insane because I have an affinity for all of those guys. I'm a huge fan of them all, but I've been a, I've been so blessed to develop a relationship with all of them individually over the years. Tracy first, you know, Tracy was right. always the realest. Yeah. You know, and I had to, you know, work on Chris because he doesn't just, you know, give yeah. over his kindness, you know what I mean? You have to kind of earn it. Dave has always been a real one, but you know, he's another one that's like kind of on God status, you know what I'm saying? So it's like it's few and far between when he comes around kind of thing. But luckily enough, I've been in that place to where those guys come around that place and I've been able to build a relationship with all of them and then to stand on the stage with all of them next to the GOAT, yeah. Eddie, you know, having his night and we're just there to support that. It just felt very pro-black, very special. It was awesome. And people loved it. Yeah. People went crazy for it. Because and it was it fucking was Christmas historic. time. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was magical. Yep. That's a beautiful thing. Frank. Here he is. I know. You want to do stand up. What advice? Well, you you know, want to ask him anything? Uh, when you guys were talking about things, and you're talking about the difference between acting and doing stand up. And I realized when you said you're nervous, is because I think all humans were afraid of being judged, right? Us being judged. So as a comedian, when you go up on stage, that's who you are. You're expressing your thoughts, your ideas. As a fighter, when we walk out there, that's who we are. So if we don't perform well, we suck. Yeah, but when you see when you're playing specific. as an actor and you're following lines, you get to be somebody else. It's not necessarily you. So I think that's why the nerves are not as crazy. Because I remember when it's I've done just stand -up, you out there. I actually walked back behind the curtain. I started shadow boxing, moved around. People were like, "What?" I'm like, "Man, this is the same exact feeling I get right before I walk same out." Same type of fight. nerves. Same type of nerves. I'm like, again, it's because it's as a comedian, you walk out there, you're being judged. Those are your ideas, your concepts, your thoughts. And so I think that's what just makes it so uh, so nerve wracking for people. The, the crazy thing is, is that if you bomb in comedy, you walk off the stage with your tail between your legs. <laughs> if you bomb in doing what you do, yeah, you're, you're like taking in the hospital. Up in a stretcher. Yeah, you're the hospital. Actually, that being said, like <laughs> I always uh, wonder about this because, like, uh, as far as like you know. I've never had a heckler yet, you know? You know, I make sure there's only one exit so I know where to stand. So if you had a heckler, what would you well, do? Well, but, well, you would try to, you know, obviously there's a word of wits and I have the mic, so you should be able to do better. But have you ever had an, a situation where the heckler actually got the better of you? One specific heckler, no, because I don't do stand-up necessarily. Like, I've done some college games oh, yeah. where I've, like, been up there with just me and a microphone for an hour, basically, and, like, I would tell my story for a half an hour and then I would Q&A it for half an hour. Okay. Some shows went great, 
some shows motherfuckers start walking out of the Q and A because they're there to see what they think is you know supposed to be a show, like okay. a stand up show, and everything's supposed to be like worked Andy Kaufman supposed to be a show, right? right. right. So seeing people walking out of the show, that's like that, yeah, like, one wah, million percent is like yo, the Q and A is my favorite. Well, yeah, because the Q and A is my favorite part. That's the only part that actually really changes. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what's going to be special for this specific show. And they weren't embracing that. You know what I mean? And there was no way I could kind of explain that. It was just like, oh, yeah, fuck this guy. He's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were rejected. And I was like, oh, y'all got, you know, better shit to do in fucking, I don't know, Oshkosh tonight. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're walking out on my shit. And like, yeah. some of those Q&As are fucking, like, really brilliant moments. Listen, like, I've had people, her, like, uh, propose to people. But never ignored, right? Yeah. There's a reason why we say that. But that judgment is real, man, you know? And, like, yeah, that, that explains a lot that's a good word for it like the fear of being judged because yeah. yeah like when it's going well you're you're fearless and when it's it's going wrong if you're new to it it's terrifying well and it is everybody's number one fear right they say what's the number one fear yep. everybody talks about it's public, public speaking, speaking right yeah. well, why because you're being judged it's just you. your character <laughs> who you are is up there and and as humans you know if, if the tribe doesn't like me that's bad, you know. Yeah. What I mean? Like that's not a good thing. So like, we want to fit in. We want to be liked. That's just, that's human like, nature. Even that excuse of like, oh, that audience was weird. It it just doesn't land as hard as it was probably me. I probably wasn't funny enough for that group. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if your shit is funny. No, but so you. So what you're saying? Let me let me translate this because I've had this conversation with um, you know lots of different uh, folks and. Um, you think there's a such thing as a bad audience or like Andrew Dice Clay, I've had this conversation with and Tom Green and a lot of different comedians. Do you think there's a such thing as a bad audience? I do. I think there's different energies for sure. Yeah. And you know, that's why we have two different audiences because it's, and mm. it's been shown to me a lot of times that, yeah, it's two different experiences with two different audiences. Some audiences like, you just have to gauge what's going on in the world. Like the live audience, if it's if it's winter time, they've been in the city, it might be raining, it might be cold, it's getting late, you know what I mean? Blah, 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 their energy might be down, you know? Like the dress rehearsal might be off the hook and then like, you know, the live audience is just not that impressed. You know what I mean? Because and SNL, do you have ever had a heckler? No, they usually get shown the door. So they'll get like one comment out or whatever but you know morning. they get descended on pretty quick you <laughs> well, know what i mean and by you saying that you think that maybe there's two different outlooks on it if a person says there's a bad audience you think they're projecting that they failed and say okay what's the audience no no i can tell you by doing this show as much as i do this show in vegas that to your point there's different energies and there are better last night was a better audience than tonight i'm being honest really with you. And yeah. you had so much energy tonight. I was blown away. Well, I was yeah. Like, I'm giving doing, it to I even told the, Jennifer, I'm like, oh, man, his, his energy, his body, he's The audience great. stood up and did their thing, but the energy started off slow. And, and, and if you notice, when I first came out, it then picked up after the razor blades, the bird act, the metamorphosis really hooked them. And then they started responding. Because I'm used to, and this sounds really conceited, but... Vegas, you go see a Cirque du Soleil show, people, it's like golf applause. You come see my show, people give me standing ovations throughout the show. Like, I've never seen so many standing ovations. Yeah, I'm and really, it's not like my friend. It's that like honest, real people. That was every crowd. Night. I really should have been here yesterday. You be doing wild shit on the stage, great. man. Like, ain't nobody talking about this. Like, why are y'all chilling right now, man? That's my fucking. That was funny, man. Every time I'm crazy. Behind, you were doing something, you just literally just close. The, yo, <laughs> like, what the, the straight fuck? jacket was one of my favorites. Like that was so like visually and like the the experience was so immersive. That like your show is that. very immersive. Thank it's it's right super. Now. I recommend it highly for anybody to see it as many times as you can because my my buddy Johnny over there like he said he saw it in May and it's ninety percent different. You know what I mean? Like that's the crazy too much. Do that wow. Several every day, every day. Every I was day. gonna ask you, you how many that's shows amazing. a year are you doing? I was doing 460 plus touring, so I was doing about 500 a year. Now I'm down to about 200 plus, but you know, it's 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 something that I that I do, and it's a love hate relationship. Uh, I love performing it, and I hate performing it because you know I wake up like I'm training with a monster over here. 
And so, like, I have an MMA gym. And in he my trains home. hard. You don't and believe what I'm saying? I don't do. eat. I, don't, I haven't eaten today. He does, hero, you heard of hero fasting? This guy eats once a day. So it means he works out with me for four hours, and he's worked out an hour before I get there. He does 66 minutes of cardio, lifts weights. Then I get there, and we do a two to four hour workout. And then he comes and does the show. I'm like, bro, I really this is my don't meal. think that's. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I told was gonna you, ask, what was in that red cup, man? I told what him, what was in that times. red cup, man? I don't know how you do that because yeah. then, because it's not like he's like going to work and digging a hole. It's like he's got to go up on stage and have personality, be enthusiastic, all of it. You know, straight sharp. Like, wow, man! Like, yeah. how do you? I'm blown away by it because I know what he goes through before he gets up there. Yeah, and I'm gonna eat when I go home tonight. But, you know, for me, as a 55-year-old man, I look back at the days of the Rat Pack. You got Sammy, yeah. Frank Sinatra. Nightly killing it. All these legends, you know? And, and um, it blows my mind. And to be able to have the opportunity to perform in Vegas and to do what I love to do for the most part, what I dreamt about doing as a child, I am so blessed. And I have to remind myself of that. And to get to meet people like you, you know, I, I, I don't know the name of the movie, so forgive me. We had no time to do any research. You know that, right? I just literally, you saw the show and I'm like, hey, dude, would you do the podcast? Frank happened to be here. This is not planned. And it's like the planets align. Well, no, I know but a lot you of had this was a terrible so movie. I don't know bring it up like, oh. You ever see that movie he did with, about the burger? Yeah, like, what a burger. That's what I was going to say. But he was like, well, you're about 16, good 18. Burger. Yeah, good yeah, burger, yeah. good burger. Like you started, yeah. how old were you when you started this business? I mean, I got my first like paycheck when I guess I was like 12 ish. What did you do at 12? Nickelodeon? No, it was a fried chicken commercial for like a fried chicken restaurant. And, uh, it wasn't even in Georgia, so I never saw the commercial. Like it was in all the surrounding states or whatever. But they paid me eight hundred bucks, and like eight hundred bucks at twelve years old might as well have been eight hundred million dollars. You know what I mean? <laughs> all right. I, so I'm I was asking. hooked immediately. But I had done theater since you know, kind of kindergarten. So you you love this from ever since you can remember. And I liked looking out and seeing smiles. Yes, I remember that being the most kind of simple aspect of what performing kind of is you know what i mean like i wasn't necessarily a joke teller but i enjoyed amusing people if you will so do you like when you're young you're doing what people give you scripts that you that you're given but now yeah do you write skits and you do you don't even on snl or do mm -hmm. you are you one of the writers or do you just if i have an idea and interpret it yeah, if I have an idea, yeah, and I, you know, I always also wanted to be a good, you know, servicer of other people's ideas as well. So, you know, writers write for me a lot because um, I'm, you know, very ensemble minded, you know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, if I have an idea, I'll bring it to them and, you know, help like sit through the, you know, pr grueling process of writing a sketch. You know what I'm saying? Like, when it's, you it's were a young, headache for did me. Did you have to, like, did your parents, as far as, like, you always hear the nightmares of child actors in, in, in mm -hmm. the movie industry in Hollywood. Were mm -hmm. your parents very hands-on protecting you? Did you have a mentor that did well, your manager? Like, yeah. how, how did how, that navigation, how did you see it? I would say all of the above, but I was also, like, you know, 15 before my first movie, so I was, you know, kind of pretty locked into who I Which was movie? going but to be. I mean, I can still be young enough to be The Mighty young. Ducks too. Mighty Ducks. You did a yeah. couple of those. Two and three. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. It's, that was a big, you know, franchise. Oh, yeah. yeah, I get free hockey tickets to this day because of it. <laughs> Seriously, you know absolutely, absolutely. For any any. I'm in. I'm in. Really? I got NHL love, like for real, and like people that play hockey. You know, current hockey players tell me all the time they grew up on the movie and blah blah blah. So it's a lot of love and respect for that that franchise. Like. It was a real one. I mean, I, did the I think opening. they can tell. They taught us how to fucking yeah, skate. I did the opening for the NHL that was broadcast the playoff games. Um, for the Golden Knights uh -huh. and whoever they were playing at the time. And I, I shot it and I spent the day and it was really good. I was like commentary and yeah. just really cool stuff. I think and they loved it. And I got tickets to go to the uh, game, but they were like in the nosebleeds. I was like, seriously? Oh, really? No, 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 I'm not giving you that. Uh, I need, I need your leads. connections, I got apparently, you. or I need to go to the game with you because I love hockey. I love yeah, the violence. you just violence. Like, snap your finger and be in the front row kind of thing? <laughs> I'm mean. not that good. Oh, poof. I'm not that, I'll teach you some stuff off camera and you'll see that. You do card stuff? Of course. Yeah. I do close up, I do all sorts of things, but, you know what, um, as, I, as I get older, 
I have three beautiful children. So I do the show. I train like a maniac because my goal is my black belt in MMA. That's my goal. That's my dream since I was like 14 years young. Actually, probably 1979, when I was in Greece, I asked my dad if I could take karate. And that's been a dream of mine since then. So for me, it's about, you know, accomplishing things for myself. And, um, you know, I love, I love, I just saw Eddie Griffin, who had an amazing show at, right here in Planet Hollywood at the Saks Theater. I love comedy. I love the things that I love. I want to immerse myself in. Like, you know, I just, I just love that. SNL was a show that I grew up on. You know, because let's face it, before there was, you know, 2000 channels and streaming companies, you know, there was like three networks and then you had Fox jump in there, which wasn't technically a network at the time. But but SNL on a Saturday night at 11 o'clock, you know, was just an opportunity to see, you know, some amazing comedians, some amazing skits. Uh, and celebrities and bands that you like loved and artists that like, it, that was the only game in town. So for me to have you here as, you know, somebody who was the longest running cast. I mean, how does that make you feel as the dude that's the longest on that show than anyone else? And you had like, I love Will Farrell. I love Adam Sandler. I love these people. I love them all, man. I love Eddie Ac Murphy. McElroy might be one of the most brilliant people walking the planet. You know Seriously? What I'm a thousand percent. Why do you say that? Listen to him talk. You know what I mean? He's a highly educated individual, but he's also, like, highly acceptable to, like, ideas that people might not be aware of, like, aliens and ghosts and, like, all that shit is real. That shit comes from a real place. Ghostbusters, like, comes from his real experience. You know what I mean? It wasn't just, like... You know, oh, Casper the Friendly Ghost should have an adult version movie kind of thing. It's like, no, these motherfuckers would be experiencing, like, real shit or whatever, especially coming from his dad. Just listen to him talk. But he takes that and puts it into comedy, you know what I'm saying? And into, like, movie writing and shit like that. And his sketches are brilliant. Like, if you watch his sketches back in the day, he, like, when he's doing the, like, fish matic or whatever, <laughs> that motherfucker is running down dialogue that is pages worth because he's speaking so fast it doesn't seem like it, but... He's saying a lot of shit, and if you slow it down and, like, word for word it, bruh, it is a list of shit, and that takes high intelligence, but also, like, high talent. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. like, there's been some insanely talented people, you know, coming in and out of those doors, and I walk past all their headshots every day when I go to work there. It's incredible. So to be the longest person that's worked there, I don't, I don't man, how, I have no idea how to get it. For it He's great. Week. A very gentle Canadian little small Jewish man. <laughs> you know I mean? like, but the dude cool. has been in the game since the beginning. He's hyper smart, heard it all, knows but always willing to listen to someone else's version of it. You know what I mean? If you got a new version of it and it works, he's he gets very excited about that. Um, and he's a people lover too, and he's a people giver because he's a concert promoter. You know what I mean? He had his own like comedy thing when he was you know younger or whatever. But his favorite lane, I think, was promoting concerts because. He likes knowing powerful people and then putting powerful people on display. And then he would have the uh, rap party, right? And I'm sure you've been to a million of those rap parties. Yeah, they're good times. There's two parties. There's a dinner party that's like all nice, you know what I mean? That's yeah, yeah. for like, you know, the adult versions of people with jobs. And then there's the, <laughs> the after what's, after what's party, the if you will. Party? Where's that? Is he there? It's usually at some club. He, I don't think he goes to those anymore. Um, How old is he now? I want to say he's in his 70s. Is he really? Yeah, like 70, five or six, seven, something like that, maybe. Um, and he's still very much involved. Every day. He's there every day. He loves it. He gives notes in between shows every every show. And, he, you know, he gives us the speech. You know, every you know we pitch on Mondays and starts the week in his office, you know, and he gives us a speech. And then on Saturday in between shows before the live show, he gives the notes sketch by sketch of what's actually going in the show and what we need to work on in the next 20 minutes before really? the show goes on. Because it's got to you know be I mean? current defense. How yeah. do you, um, and I know you probably have to go, so I don't want to keep you Where am I going? I, I can't go away from a guy that was just flying on stage. <laughs> <laughs> We're hanging out. out the door to come back. <laughs> We're hanging out. Yeah. You know? I like, got to learn that shit. How, how do you... 
because it's got like, all right, let me say, you saw my show, you saw my comedy bit, right? Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Coming from you, that means the world to me. But I had a genuine. lot. Genuine. You know what I mean? Like, that's a love for people kind of thing. That's my favorite comedy. Like, shit that will work in anybody's house, basically. Well, it took me a long time to hone in and to refine it and to do that. You don't have that opportunity. You're doing a skit and you're literally learning it on a Monday and then you have to perform it, what, five, six days later. Like, how do you, like, I can't even comprehend, you know, what that's like because I have so much time to like dial in my chops to get, because it's a timing. It's like seeing what works because what I always do is I listen to the audience. They'll tell me every night what they like and what they don't like. And I edit my show based on the audience's re feedback, their response. But you don't have that opportunity. You can't go out and say, okay, uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, I'm gonna run out to a comedy shop and like work out my material so that Saturday night, I know it's gonna kill. And even if you could do that, you couldn't do that shit in four days, five days. How do you how do you have the confidence and and know where that moment is where people are going to laugh and know that it's going to work? That would be like really frightening for me. It is hyper terrifying until you let it go. You know what I mean? You you learn to lean on smarter people, surround yourself with smarter people. You know what I mean? And like there's a lot of very smart writers on that show. They're all brilliant, like very, very brilliant people. And. I use their litmus test as well as the everyday person, like our crew members, you know what I mean? So, so like, they try it out on the crew members? No, I just listen to them when we're right. rehearsing and okay. they're the, kind of the only ones around, basically, like milling around in the background and we're rehearsing basically just for the cameras and ourselves, basically, but they're listening, you know what I mean? Like, why Is there a lot of shit? tweaks that happen? Because like, I have done some independent movies, some, some different commercials, mm -hmm. And I did Andrew Dice Clay's Showtime series. Yeah. And uh, and I had, you know, he's a dear friend and I'm very grateful for the opportunity, but I yeah. learned my lines. I'd like dial them in. Oh yeah. And then and then you get a change. Oh, and, it and you're like, shit holy off. shit, I just spent <laughs> how much time remember and I'm a stupid person. Like I was like, I really was you, I yeah, took the short in school yeah. and and I didn't go to college. Yeah. Like Frank is a highly in intelligent human being. Yeah, gotta, I am a stupid yeah. person. Like the fact of the matter, like that I'm sure there's a million changes that goes on. Yeah. Right. How do you adapt? I mean, we use cue cards. They, they tell you to like, make sure you like stay on the cards. Is it a teleprompter or an actual cue card? It's actual cue cards. We're like the last show to use like and why? actual cue Why cards. not? Because you have multiple people, I guess. We have, there's multiple people, but also I think it's just Lauren's probably like old smart fear of technology. You know what I mean? If one of those prompters goes down, then you got a problem. You know what yeah. I mean? Like there's a guy on each card and the only problem is, are they all going to be in syncopation, you know, with the cards? And sometimes they're not, you know what I mean? Sometimes what this guy do? over here will be a page ahead. What do you do? You have to be a professional and like know... Number one, pay attention in rehearsal to know what's off, basically. Right. You know what I mean? You have to just be hyper, especially if it's your sketch, you're going to be hyper aware of everything anyway. But, but I'm even sure if they you're screw just up. A they, they're right? human, absolutely. Yeah. So what so do you like, do if you're like, your next line hasn't come up? Yeah, the guy that has my cards will be on my page or whatever, but the person behind me that has this person that I'm talking to's cards might be a page ahead or some shit. And then that person starts talking before I'm done with my line or whatever. And you just gotta be like, oh, they cut me off early. Do I need to clarify or can I just let that go? You know what I mean? Sometimes you gotta roll with the punches. Do you have an inner ear? Aware. I have a strong ear. Do you have an inner ear so that somebody could feed you like stuff? Like, like oh, no, no. kind of Johnny Depp, I hear that when he does a movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. he has an inner ear and people are feeding him the lines. He doesn't even remember the lines. Yeah, yeah. That's that's why he talks slowly. That's for cool cadence. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Newhart used to do that kind of shit. Like Newhart's timing really? is like that because he's thinking about his lines kind of thing. But no, I'm just hypersensitive and like listening to everybody. So I I mean, would they teach you that in acting school. Like just listen to your fellow performers, but also when you're doing comedy, you gotta listen to the audience too. You gotta know when to crank it up, when to pull it back, blah, blah, blah. And I just stop. Yeah, don't just give up. <laughs> I've done that too. I've flubbed a line and kind of just like, 
not reacted to that and just let the shit be weird and it was just way too weird. You know what I mean? Like silence is It brings deadly. attention to it probably. Yep. Silence is just It's a killer. Oh yeah, yeah. It's good right And then you're like thinking like and and because you know when I do an illusion it's slow motion for me. And it's like, not an I illusion. That shit moment. was real. Yeah, I could see every... <laughs> you were really flying out there, man. <laughs> I could see every moment as it's happening. So in the beginning, though, everything is overwhelming because yeah. everything is in hyper... It's like when I first sparred with Frank, like he's throwing punches at me and it's like, holy shit, I'm reacting and I'm overwhelmed. But then when you do it, for a little bit of time, you realize, oh, okay, I see that. I read right. that foot's gonna, he's gonna throw a roundhouse. You know, you see the things coming. But like when you're doing a show like that and you're live and you don't have that preparation, and it's like even though you're more seasoned because you've been doing it for over 20 years, and you don't have like it, it, it I just, I just like honestly have all the respect in the world for you because like that takes a special breed of person, comedian, actor to be able to do that. Cause that shit is, it's just so different than anything I'm able to experience. Cause I've never done that much. I did one huge thing that was live television. It was the season finale of mind freak. I had, over 50,000 people that showed up to see me escape a building that was going to implode. And the pressure that I felt, it was just insane. I can't imagine that every week. Yeah, it's, a, it's insane. And I think we only do it because it has to be done. You know, like Lauren says that all the time. We only put the show up at 1130 because it's 1130, not that you know, we're ready to do it. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, it's time to go. You know what I'm saying? So like- What do you prefer? If you had a pick, if you had it for the rest of your life, do one or the other, it's either like live television or movies, what would it be? Live television. Really? Yeah, movies take too long. They're nice and glamorous and shit, but it just takes too long out of your life. And it's a 12 hour day, especially if you're the movie star, you know what I'm saying? It, you're there all your, it's all your time. You know what I mean? So. However long that movie might be, which is, you know, people talk about like Ezra Miller kind of losing his mind. I get it. We watched The Flash, that shit is complicated. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sure it took a while. And he's going in and out of characters, versions of himself and this, that, and the other. Like, that's a lot of mental kind of hurricane going on, you know, when the cameras are off even, you know, let alone giving your, you know, time that it, you just give up your life basically for all these hours of the day for years. It's, it's, it's a tough thing. So I love it, you know, because we go back to talking about training. Like I've been, I've been trained for it, you know, and a lot of like SNL people that actually get the job are coming from these improv houses where they're trained to, you know, it's the most similar experience to a show, Growling, Second City or whatever. It's tougher on standups because a stand-up existence is a more individualized existence. It's not so ensemble-minded, so it's a, you know, and it's not television performing either. Like the Groundlings, like I said, they teach you to perform kind of like, you know, stage performing, like perform out to where the cameras are. And like sure. a stand-up will actually like turn and like look this way and like forget that there's cameras and shit. You know what I mean? Like, Did you ever little break tricks out and just shit. Whole, like hysterically and you could not compose yourself? I've I seen it had, happen. Though. I haven't had one of those moments where I've like broken down and not been able to perform, but I've been pissed that I was left out of the show, for sure. Like, tell I, me about like, that. I mean, you get donutted. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, I call it donutted. Donut it. Yeah. yeah, because you just get wind up getting a zero. Frank likes yeah. the whole. You know, we all do. <laughs> the whole family. Um, but I came from having already two shows on Nickelodeon and having a lot of experience. So like not being utilized, you know, felt like a failure on a lot of people's part. And I was heated. Like, why are y'all wasting my time with this shit or whatever? It just happens. Well, yeah, it's just so one I mean, of those things. Like, I had sketches that parts. didn't go well probably and they got cut. You know what Did mean? you feel like you were going to be let go of the show before? You always feel that way because you, 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 know, you get brought back every year, basically. Like they make mm. a decision on you every summer, basically. It's still to this day. Like I get the phone call like whether or not they're going to invite me back. Kind of and thing. When's, the, when's the new season begin? 
hopefully, well, usually in October, but we're striking at the moment. So. Yeah, yeah, with well, the writer's strike. And we the, will see, but yeah, I love live and television. And tell you when the new season, whenever it happens. Yeah, I'm, awesome. I'll be ready. Um, but, but yeah, my just, heart, going back to what you were yeah, saying, that, like, you know, it's it's a tough thing doing the show. Like, my heart goes out to those hosts that aren't entertainers, you know what I'm saying? Because it is a lot to pick up and a lot to, like, trust, you know what I'm saying? It's like, there's going to be a lot of changes or whatever, but trust the cue cards. That's, yeah. that's hard for people can, to do. Can you, um, can you tell us, and I don't know if you can, but we would love to know, like, just like maybe a guest host that was like just awesome and then a guest host that like maybe you had a beef with or just some shit that went down. <laughs> like. You know, just let's talk about beef, shall we? Yeah, um, we love that what, gossip, we, right? Gossip, yeah. Frank. Uh, that's, what, that's what you do as a fighter. I mean, the great <laughs> hosts, I think, are pretty obvious. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everybody will watch the show and be like, "That was a great show." So that more than likely was a great host. You know what I mean? So Eddie, yeah. obvious, agreeable, by far. Any SNL host. alumni? Yeah. They're all great. Like they know the show. It's a week off, damn near, for us because they can will damn near the show. Forget about it. Hyper funny, but also one of the sweetest people in the world. Really? really? Always has his parents around. Just a Midwestern, genuine dude. And it's weird when tall people do that because they come down to your level and they get like in your eyes and shit. And it's like, well, what are you thinking about? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, back up tall, man. Yeah. <laughs> Will Farrell, I heard the crazy story about in California. He was working on some uh, movie that was... Um, he was like uh, a Mexican, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? What was that movie? It was called El something. Yes. It's a Spanish title. He walked in by himself, dressed up in the, in the garb, into a Mexican cantina, if you will, and played it off the entire time as that character with no cameras around, no people around. Right, the cantina was just normal people. Yeah, and just, I feel like he learned Spanish recently for that thing. It yeah. wasn't like Is he knew crazy? Spanish all his life. I think he like recently learned. He's a like mental capacity to do that. And yeah, was speaking like that whole movie. He spoke like full Spanish the whole time. It's just crazy. I mean, if you watch wow. Your Welcome America when he was George Bush, then he did that live Broadway right, play yeah. or whatever. Running down a shit ton of information and names and dates and shit like that. He's just, he's got he a brain like that. that. It's like Jim Carrey when he played Andy Kaufman. He was Forget in about character. It. If you met Jim Carrey. You know these people's names, I think, for a reason. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, they, you, you, know, you know Jim Carrey? What's he like? I am one of the biggest fans of Jim. I had his autograph, like, headshot on my wall growing up as a kid. Is it a check for a million dollars or $10 million? I wish. It was, no, no, I'm just joking. It was that his was headshot, <laughs> yeah. Like, it was, like, a picture of him and it very generic, like, black letters that said, Hi, Keenan, at the top, and then his signature. So somebody, like, you know, kind of wrote that thing and, like, addressed it to me or whatever. And he just signed like it. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure he signed just a stack and they gave me one or whatever. Um... <laughs> But, well, you know, he's, he's a, carry. yeah, he's a special individual. Like, there's not a lot of people that can do what he did. Chris Farley, another one. You know what I mean? Like, Andy Kaufman was before your time. Yeah. I have an affinity for, I just loved him because he broke what was reality and what was an illusion. Because people think that illusion is just when you get into what I do. But it's not. Illusion can be, you know, nothing to do with magic tricks. He created the illusion, like, on and off stage, you know, that that no one in comedy that I'm aware of, like people like took the whole wrestling thing serious, the milk and cookies, you know, all of these crazy things that he did. Like, you know, and, and then Lauren was brilliant at capitalizing on his either popularity or not popularity and having this, this you know, kind of vote should we keep him on the show or should we keep And you him? need a guy like that. You need a guy that's got a business mind. Like how, you know, Dave Chappelle talks about, like, black people get a white friend because somebody needs to talk to the cops when they come around. You know what I mean? Like, that kind of shit. Like, Lauren was that guy that was around all these hyper-talented hippies. You know, right. Gilda and Belushi and, like, all these people that just wanted to do their craft. And someone needed to be the liaison with corporate America, and he does that well. You know were, you, I mean? were you around with Chris Farley? 
I wasn't, but he came on all that, and I was able to perform with him on that show. He and that seemed was like the nicest moment. guy in the world. Are you kidding? Unbelievable. Just a fucking force of happiness and joy and hyper, hyper, like, clever, like... Physical comedy. Intelligent comedy. Yeah, yeah. physical, but also, like, solid reference. You know what I mean? Like, just a good comedian. And, like, yeah, he was a great dude. I had the pleasure of, and I know they were good friends, David Spade. Forget about it. Right, Another David one. invited me to do his, forgot the name of his television series. It was years ago. He invited me to do it. And I did it. I made his girlfriend disappear. And uh -huh. then he came to see me backstage. And it was like this whole, it was, but he's like, the, I, I've known him. I haven't seen him in years, but he is just like him and Farley together. They were brothers, man. It was incredible. But on, on camera, they were just magic. Perfect. The yin and the yang. Perfect. Okay. Yep. And you, still to this day, like, Dave was a solid dude. Super funny. Like, him and Dana have such a great podcast together. The fact that Dana and David knew each other before they were both on SNL is just crazy. Yeah. It just shows you that there is life outside of, you know, that, you know, kind of legacy kind of existence, basically. You know, that everybody kind of comes from and then also lives through while you're living that experience, you know, and the, to see them have that bond and that friendship through something so crazy, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know? Like, I wish I had that, like, I think that's why, you know, I was so happy when Tracy embraced me, you know what I mean? Because I was always looking for that kind of, you know, big brother, like, take me under my wing kind of thing, because I've been in the business, you know, for a long Forever. time now, you know? So, like, I was always... But I'm not a stand-up, you know what I mean? Like that stand-up brotherhood is much more immediate amongst stand-ups kind of thing. Like yeah. actors, we kind of fend for ourselves basically a little bit. I have one more question for me because you have been more than generous with your time. And then if Frank wants to ask you something, you know, um, and I just lost it. God, Frank asked it so I can think about what it is. Cause All it right, well, this is actually help you that? out too then. Um, mm -hmm. As far as, I mean, like the longest tenured uh, uh, cast member. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of repetition to do with this, but in, in your business also, you have to have your personality. You gotta show up. You can't, you know, some people don't realize in the entertainment world, it's sometimes harder than working a normal job. Yeah. Whereas like, hey man, you gotta dig a hole, whether you have a bad attitude or not, you can dig the hole. Right. But if you gotta go up on stage and be, you know, charismatic, mm -hmm. turn it on. Is there anything you've learned to help you have that ability to, all right, look, I'm in front of somebody, I got a fan, and boom, mm -hmm. I gotta flip that switch. Yeah, I mean, I just, I think one of my bigger blessings is, you know, I've been able to be very observant, you know what I mean? And I can observe when people are enjoying my company and when they're not, when they're not. Socially aware. You know are we I mean? enjoying your company? Yeah. I hope so. We because are Because I've been trying company. to fucking entertain and just process what's happening right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. And Likewise. like, it's just, you just never really like know how people are going to, like you said, like me and your heroes can be a weird thing or whatever. But I always try to like, you know, be cordial at least, you know what I'm saying? To Have people. you had like a weird experience with like a hero? Yeah. Like, can yeah, you say there, what there's happened weird or who people. It was, or? Well, one of my, people I'll just tell you the story. I won't necessarily yeah. say who it was or whatever, but one of my heroes, uh, I got a job on a movie like the night before because somebody dropped out. And the director called me and I showed up, you know, whatever, Can without what any kind of preparation. Um, All right, you can't. <laughs> I think that would, give, that would give it away. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm already giving it away, like telling this kind of story okay. because the industry will know kind of whatever. Right. Anyway, I show up the next day. I had already worked with one of the people in the movie or whatever on another movie. And the story is about that person. And it was like, I don't know, I showed up, you know, early, like 9, 10 a.m. or something and didn't work till 4 or 5, classic movie shit. Right. Hurry After lunch or whatever type shit or whatever. So I was there all day. And then my scene was going to be up after lunch, but they wanted to rehearse it before they went to lunch. So I was like, all right, whatever, I'm ready. They came and got me. And then the scene that they were doing previously was on like a third floor of a studio. But the scene that we were about to shoot was like on the first floor. But the PA or somebody took me to where he thought they were going to be because that's right. where they just were. We go up there and nobody's there. I hear his fucking earpiece going off. 
where the fuck are you? We got these guys waiting, blah, blah, blah. And it was like a movie with Legends or whatever. And she was like, I don't know where, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're coming now. Go downstairs. I walk in the room. They're all, it's like this whole room just turned and like looked at me like I was just holding everybody up, being an asshole. I was like, no, 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 no. But I saw my one buddy that was directing. I said hey to him real quick. And then I sat down and I was just like saying hi to my acting cohorts for the scene. And I started from the right to the left. And the last person was the person that I knew, but this person was a legend. This person was a legend. I said, hey, how you doing? And then when I got to this person, they were like, oh, sit the fuck down already in front of like all Seriously? these people. Seriously? Yeah. What did you do? I looked at him like he was crazy, but I didn't like, you know, do anything necessarily. I just sat down and got into the scene and we had to like work for the rest of the day as well. You know you what I'm saying? You need a friend so, like, like Frank. Yeah, I was just like, <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> Actually, why, two of us, where, you know what I mean? Like, wants, why would you do that all the time? Yeah, like, why embarrass you? Like, it's stupid. Some people are just, you know, they don't realize what they're doing maybe in the moment. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they it just could just be a total kind of thing. Uh -huh. A lot right. of that as well. Some people are just assholes. Yeah. And that as well. And then, like, <laughs> when it's, like, one of your heroes, you don't want to just, like, bottom line them to being just a fucking dick. You know what I'm uh, saying? Well, we turn our cameras off. You're going to tell me who it was because I'm dying to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I won't say nothing. And, in, and my final question is, we have a common friend who might, might be calling right now. I'm talking about Mike Tyson. Yeah. Mike is the bomb. The best. Right? And, and, and what are you doing or what have you done with Mike? Well, I mean, Mike is a good friend. And he's invested in our production company. My buddy Johnny, like, flipped his whole weed company on his head. Like, he had, like, Tyson weed and he took Tyson weed because it was like a lot of bad business going on or whatever right. and like developed Tyson 2.0. But then he also gave them the brilliant idea of Mike Bites, which is his like weed edibles that are like shaped the like ear, ears. The Holy Holyfield. <laughs> that guy right there is fucking right. idea. You know what I mean? Just But did you, weren't you involved shit. with this live show? And yeah, we produced like all the, like, my, my buddy like produced the fight, you know what I'm right. saying? And then like whatever else kind of live shit, you know, hopefully we'll be the producers on it and shit like that. But awesome. it's also in the family. You know, like just friends of like him and his wife, and like, yeah, you know, he's just a he's a good dude. Like he's awesome. Podcast, yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, and his brother, you know, his brother in law, Zim. You know, he's one of our you know investors too, or like one of our partners. You know, it's just a very family kind of movement with Mike. Without me, really haven't been around him much. I've only met him like twice or whatever. But yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, he's cool. He, he's an awesome, awesome dude. He's a maniac. I, yeah, he 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 he's chilled a lot because I I I I used to hang out with him in 2000 and I want to say five or six, Tommy. When was that? 2005 or six? And you you survived. Yeah. No, it was he used to hang out. We used to go out and yeah. we'd, we'd hang out at uh, clubs and. You know, and I'm just so, like, so happy for him that, you know, like, he has Kiki and... He's a big, giant heart. Yeah, you know he has mean? a great heart, yeah. and uh, he comes, he's been to my house, and he supports the pediatric cancer stuff. He's yeah, just for a, sure. an awesome dude, and, you know, I, I did his, his Hotboxing uh, podcast, which yeah. was fun, but... Yeah. Uh, no, Same. you know, like you, you meet someone like him, and you're just like, that dude is for real. I want yeah. Frank to meet, I want to get him at the... At my gym and and teaches his uh, his Tyson. I mean, when you know how to break people, do what do you do? You even get angry anymore? Or do you try to avoid that like the incredible? No, he Hulk? gets angry. <laughs> 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 well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, we're recording this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell, tell us if you, you want to, this just really just quick. Like, if you what, want to hear us, like this, this is fun one, stuff. What's one good trigger well, for well, just you? Tell you him just can't let go. And also tell them like about how you started at Spearmint and like how many people you beat up a week. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> it's it's not making this up, it's just true. Right, look, there's a technique that I use as far as part of my uh, self-defense curriculum. Because mm -hmm. you know, you know, MMA, mixed martial arts is great when you're fighting, but a lot of times, you know, we start out in a fighting stance ready to go. So there's some techniques I call neutral stance where I mm -hmm. teach it from people that are chest to chest. And so when I'm describing this and teaching it to Chris, it's like, well, you know, have you done this before? I'm like, four or 500 times. Like what? I'm like, I've probably choked out unconscious four to 500 people with this maneuver. And I've only had a few ever, you know, uh, stop me or, or, or give me an issue with it. Yeah. And so uh, 
there's a lot of reps and practice that. And it's funny because at the club it was great because people stood there, hey man, you know, try to talk to them, explain what's going on. They, they get angry. And, it was and, a, and a lot of guys have a lot of bravado yeah. when it first starts off, but they just have no bravado. concept. They don't realize. You know they're a, they're a gazelle and I'm a lion. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> the great thing is that the work about putting someone out with a choke is that you know when they wake up they're extremely calm, yeah. very receptive to the yeah, instructions absolutely. I have at that moment. So yeah. guys sit there and they look up and I'm like, hey man, so I think we had a misunderstanding. Um, I, I, obviously I'm not here to hurt you because right. I could have. Do you want to step outside and start over? You know, and most right. of them, yeah, yeah, buddy, let's go. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. So those techniques I got to actually imply or employ uh, to a great uh, <laughs> a lot of reps. Yeah. Let me just say it this way, because he's very modest and humble. When you are in the UFC, you're dealing with killers. And when you're in the heavyweight division, which is the most difficult and challenging division in the world, and you're the champion two times, and you have broken more bones, more submissions than pretty much anyone else, um, it really speaks volumes. Um, and to still just be chill. You know oh, what I mean? Like you could be walking around well, you know with like a I think a lot of guys aren't chill because they want to prove a point. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, you know, and I always hated some of my partners or bouncers that do that. Do we have a situation that was settled? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you could see that it was coming to a resolution. Right. And they wanted to uh, go ahead and instigate. Because it made them feel good to beat somebody up. I'm like, all right, man, beating yeah. up some drunk guy at a bar, if that's your, uh, your you're, you're going to go home and that's what you're hanging your hat on, you get some confidence, you know, yeah. you chill out, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's not that important. Right. So you do kind of like, you know, you don't sit there and worry about some of the things that other people worry about because, you know, some guys go home like, I wonder if that guy thinks I can kick his ass or not. Yeah. I don't care whether you think. So that would be like a gazelle worried that if the lion could eat him or not. I'm like, right. dude, I could. I don't yeah. need to prove it. I don't care. Right, yeah. But he, here's the thing. If you ever... I feel like that, dog. <laughs> if you ever <laughs> want to do a class, just... Basic stuff yeah. Yeah, absolutely. that will change your life absolutely. literally in three or four Can seconds. Can we do it over Zoom? <laughs> yeah. No, you come to my gym I like when you're in Vegas. Go three to four yeah. seconds, you will literally put somebody out unconscious from what we call neutral stance, which is, you know, how fights usually start a guy in Just front of chest. you. You know, and by the way, not that you're going to go learn it and go start choking out people. It's not why you learn it, but it gives you a sense of confidence to know if you're in a situation, especially now in some of these cities with that people have gone crazy, you know that you have a plan that you can implement well, and that's that actually can give you like, a chance. When I first yeah. start teaching people, like if I ever have a sense that you're not a good person, I don't teach people. Mm. Like just because, I mean, honestly, I mean, if you learn how to do a rear naked choke and you know how to apply it, I mean, kill somebody. You, you know how to kill somebody. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm, I'm teaching you how to actually end someone's life right. very easily and rapidly. So it's like, if, and your first and last name, and date of birth, please. <laughs> so if you're of, a, of, of bad character, I'm not going to be responsible. For that, yeah, you know? that's some real sensei shit, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a wonderful discipline and it's it's incredible. So um anytime you want, you're always welcome. Yeah, it's fun. Come play around. Yeah, yeah, yeah you just come over my, my gym. I, I'm in Science. Henderson. You come and have some fun. But I am so grateful of A that you were at the show, B that you agreed to do this, and 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 C that you're just such a wonderful, giving human being. Can I just say Yeah. It is impressive how present you are. Like you do the show hundreds of times a year or whatever. You've been doing it for years as well, but you make it seem like it's the first show ever. You know what I mean? And you're so present with people that are in the audience. Like you touched my shoulder going past, you know what I mean? And that was, had nothing to do with until, it was 40 minutes later before you announced to the audience that I was there or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And it was just like, some people need to like tune out everything and not be aware of anything to kind of to do their job or whatever. But you seem to be hyper aware of everything. You know what I mean? That's, that's around you and your surroundings. And that is just so, it's so pleasant to witness. And it's amazing because you could easily, well, you both, both of you could easily be walking around with boas and, like. yeah, <laughs> and so fur grateful. coats. I'm so grateful and your for, heads the, up. for the yeah. beautiful, kind words and the sentiment. Um, but you're only as good as your last show. And if I die tonight or tomorrow, 
I'm only as good as what I did in my last show. And I was told that as a young teenager, 13 or 14 years old, and I take that really serious. I must give 100% of what I'm capable of in that moment to the audience because they paid their hard earned money to come see me when they had 500 other choices in Vegas and I got to deliver every bit of me, no matter what's going on in my personal life, no matter what injuries I have, if I can get up out of bed and, and, and walk, I have to do the show because I used to come to Vegas when I had no money. I stayed in the cheapest hotels. I used to walk from one part of the strip to the other part of the strip because I couldn't afford a car to rent. And I had a show that I paid tickets, paid for tickets when I was in New York before I flew out here and the show was canceled. And I swore because I knew how I felt that if I could walk, I would never cancel a show and I would always give 100% if I'm on that stage because every audience at the end of the day will never be in the same room ever again in the history of the world. That's my one unique opportunity to experience this with them and I got to give every part of me to do that. You know who you sound like? Who? Kobe Bryant. That is mama mentality all day long. That motherfucker used to play through injuries and his wife would ask him like, you could just rest it. And he's like, no, what about the people that paid to see me? That they don't really like, it's not fair for them to understand that like my fourth toe is pointing left. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get out there and play. You know what I mean? Like, that's a moment. That's a, I respect it. Yeah, and I well respect I respect you, so you much. and I love you and I love I you and respect you so I'm much grateful too, for this opportunity. Likewise. So we're gonna wrap it up right now. We hope you enjoyed this surprise episode of Talking Junkies. Make sure you check us out. We'll put out episodes when we feel it's right. We don't, we're doing this for fun, not because we have to, but because we want to. We'll see you next time. These motherfuckers will be flying, yo. It's crazy. Crazy. This is Chris Angel's Talking Junkies. <laughs>